Good morning. Are we on? Good morning. Welcome to DeGraff United Methodist Church, both here and online. We're so glad that you have gathered with us today. In June, the first full week in June, our church is responsible for the uh, park lunches that we'll be serving. That's the 6th. And then the 7th, 8th, and 9th, that's when we're going to be starting the second harvest delivery of lunches to the kids in our communities. So um, we need some volunteers to help out. It's, it's about two hours, 11 to 1. And so be praying about that. So it's the first full week in June that we need help um, Monday through Thursday. And um, like I said, pray about it. Um, I know it'll be a blessing. 
Okay, any other announcements? He has risen! He is risen indeed! <laughs> Can't believe it's a sixth Sunday after <laughs> Easter already. This is Easter tide, you know. Okay. Please stand if you're able and join us in our gathering song. We should be getting pretty familiar with this by now.
Join me in our call to worship. The Lord of wind and water, of calmness and peace, you have provided a way for us to experience the goodness, the calm, the peace. Your Son came into the world to save us, that to give us a peace and calm that the world cannot provide. Give, give us, us courage to become disciples who can calm the seas of doubt, anger, and negativity, bringing hope and peace. Remind us of the many blessings you have poured upon us. In the name of Jesus, the risen Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Be seated. As our friends, our praise and worship friends exit, I will share with you this morning the reading of Psalms, and this morning appropriately fits uh, Psalm 67. May God be merciful and bless us. May his face smile with favor on us. May your ways be known throughout the earth. Your saving power among people everywhere. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole world sing for joy, because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Then the earth will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will richly bless us. Yes, God will bless us. And people all over the world will fear him. Amen. With that, we come to our time of praying together. Put my eyes on so I can see you. So how are we doing this week? I'm going to ask that question again later, but what do we need praying for? Everybody's good. Let's go home. Keep doing what you did this past week. Just go. Anybody? Tom's got one. Yeah, just pray for traveling mercies for our sister and brother-in-law coming up from Florida this week for a graduation up in Kenton, but pray for them. I can't remember the name of the, the kid that died at Kenton Ridge this um, past week, but if we could pray for his family today. I know they're, they're having his funeral, and just keep them in your thoughts and prayers. I have a praise. Yesterday, we went and did orientation at Teal College um, for a mirror, which is four hours four hours away in Pennsylvania. And um, ask me again August 20th when move-in day is. But um, just for kind of like being, especially her, being around the same people, the same community, the same friends, the same classmates, the same teammates for really 13 years of her life that she was just, and everyone was just welcoming like with the freshmen when she met teammates, coaches, administrators, faculty. So just, I kind of gave like what I thought was going to be more of a stressful day, just welcomed. And she was more excited when we left than when we got there. So. I don't know if some of you know them, but um, I'll ask for, for prayers for two of my folks from Maplewood. Uh, Jenny Waddell and Lindsay Alexander uh, were in a car accident Friday night, and I don't know if any of you know either one of them. Um, they were on Dingman Slagle, headed back towards Sydney, and um, you kind of know the curves right there. He goes down deep right there at 12 on Maplewood and then comes back up. Well, she comes back up over the hill. Um, there was a drunk driver that was left to center. She had about just enough time to try and pull it into the ditch. Um, 
the whole driver's, basically he just went clear up the driver's side of the car. Um, I've got to see pictures of the car and um, I expected less. Knowing that um, Lindsay was driving, she uh, went to Mary Bertan and got a few stitches in her leg. Uh, Jenny is in Miami Valley. She fractured uh, the orbital bones around her eye um, and they'll probably have to be reconstructed. But other than that, they can't find anything else wrong. Um, that's the report that I got. And then to see pictures of the car, there's no logical explanation. I can't, I cannot explain it logically to you. Um, there's nothing left of the driver's side of that car. I have no idea how Lindsay has just a cut on her leg. Um, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Um, but God is uh, in, in the protection business. So um, just continue to pray for Jenny and for um, Lindsay, uh, that they continue to heal um, and that the emotional trauma um, is not uh, overwhelming for them because there was a lot of that in part of that. Is there anybody else this morning? Well, sure. Again? Dick Birch had come and sawed me out. <laughs> <laughs> and he plans on coming to get rid of another tree later that's just barely holding on to my limb. So. How, many, how many trees have fallen on your lane now at this point? I don't know how many, but it was two <laughs> came down this time, so that's, you know, it's plenty. <laughs> Uh, you, ha you have that a lot, I feel like. But yes, praise for people that are there to help and clear it for you, right? Absolutely. Anybody else? They're not here, so I can talk about them. Um, Grady and Jill are in Lebanon. Uh, just pray that they get to and from safely. Um, I'm faced with the reality that this might be his last tournament um, as a soccer player. Just He could probably do it next spring if he wanted to, but he's probably going to have to go. He'd have to go play for a team far away, um, a team like Toledo FC or Cincinnati somewhere, um, just in order to have a team to play on. So, And I, I don't know that that's... It's his, love, it's his first love, but I don't know that that's going to be uh, the direction he wants to take anymore. So um, I doubt, barring another miracle, <laughs> uh, I doubt that they'll be in the championship game today. So um, I got to see one final tournament game yesterday, uh, a horrible 0-6 to six loss. But um, I'll, uh, I'll always remember that and just, uh, just pray that they get home safe. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Gracious and loving God, even when we haven't deserved it, even when we haven't earned it, you have chosen to love us regardless. And God, we pray that this morning we do not understand that we come to you in our own will, with our own strengths and our own hands, but that we come to you, the foot of your throne, only because of Jesus. There are so many, so many religions, so many things that we could get ourselves wrapped up in in this world, and yet there's only one in which the deity or the creator or the God would choose sacrifice to save his creation. You don't call us to, to lord power over anyone. You don't call us to control anyone. If anything, you call us to surrender. To surrender to you first and then to others second. And that's how we love each other and love you. And there's no other God like you. We're so grateful that you have 
chosen this method because of Jesus. We get to talk to you. We get to ask. And a lot of times we don't get because we don't ask. And so this morning you've heard us out loud. We know that uh, my wife and, and son, Jill and Grady, are traveling. Don's uh, sister and brother-in-law are traveling. And we just pray that you would watch over those that are, that are traveling to and from, uh, that they arrive to their destinations safely and without harm. We know that there's a young man in Kenton Ridge that passed away, and God, we want to lift up his family and his community and his friends to you, that they would uh, feel your presence of calm and peace in the midst of grief and mourning, that they have friends, they have life, and even though it's fleeting, there's a, an eternity awaiting us. And we're so grateful and give you praise that um, Amer had such a great experience that this great kid can continue to be a great kid and have good influences and feel safe and at home in her new college coming up in August. And we pray for mom and dad as they navigate waters with one less practice to run to and one less thing to do. There's an emptiness that, that needs to be filled and just pray that that gets filled with you, God. And God, there's a couple of people that are healing from wounds today, Jenny, Waddell and Lindsay Alexander, and we pray that you would watch over them, give them physical healing, um, but along that, give them emotional healing from trauma as well. Uh, you know what they've been through, and um, just pray that you would put people in their life that would bring them peace and hope and all the goodness that this life can bring. There's a reason that you have walked them through this. Let them know what that reason is. And God, for each of us, there's weights that we're carrying. There's things that we are, are, are burdened with. And we want to take this moment where we can just, in this silence, communicate to you directly. And we can talk with you one-on-one. -on -one, and we can just unload all of our burdens and our cares to you. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear those messages in our hearts that we're lifting to you and give us an assurance that you're there. Allow us to feel that you're bending an ear to hear us. Allow us to understand that you are with us. And that no matter what, you are wanting more than anything from us is obedience. You want us to be transformed every day into the likeness of your son Jesus so that the world will see him and have hope. We are part of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. And we pray that you give us the strength to do that. That you forgive us. That you heal us. And that you allow us to stand firm and confident in who we are because of you, Jesus. This Jesus taught us that we should love, honor, and protect each other, that we should care for one another, that we should love you, God, first and foremost, and that everything would come from that. Everything in our life would come from that. We hold him to that promise, and we try every day to do as he's asking us to do. May we remember those things found in how he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying with us. If you are able, stand and join me. It's our fourth Sunday, so we can stand and, and join in reciting what we say we believe, proving this is what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For those of you willing to stay standing for the reading of Scripture, you can. If you need to sit down, you can do that. Uh, God speaks sitting or standing, I promise. Today I want to share with you from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. And so they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Jesus woke up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped. And there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. This is God's word for God's people. You may be seated. And I know I forgot to, uh, those of you worshiping with us online, you are welcome here too. And I pray that you uh, uh, feel free and comfortable to put a prayer request in the comments. And that way we can continue to pray for you and join in together with you in this. So how was your week? Long. I heard long. I agree. Long. Up, down, bad, and good. There's somewhere in between bad and good too that sometimes we are. (laughs) Somewhere in there, whatever it was, I hope that you have had the the recollection that we're still a people of God on mission. And so we can recognize that and find out how we're doing. How was our worship this week? How was our time of reflection? We get to look at ourselves. How was our prayer life? How did that go? Did we study? Did we learn anything new? How did we help someone out? How did we serve? Five easy ways at the end of your week, go, all right, what did I do this week? How did I do? It's pretty simple. You caught me early, before anything started. Happy sixth Sunday of Easter. (laughs) Woo! Jesus is risen. Woo! Yes. I'm telling you, I'm going to start that. I'm going to pen my own new liturgy around the Eastertide weeks. Hopefully it'll catch on. And what we've been doing during Eastertide is what happens after Jesus rises from the grave is that his disciples are changed. They're made into something different because of what they've seen. They see him alive. He was once dead. Now he's alive. He he ascends to heaven. He sends back the Holy Spirit. And now they're filled with this spirit. They don't have a copy of the New Testament. They don't have a building that they can come to and worship. So they are doing, the only thing they know and the only way that that early church grew was with the power that was in their personal testimony to the resurrection. How does our life, how can our life look like that? That's the way we started this month. Stay humble. Talked about how our humility can lead us to not realize that maybe we're not the only thing in the world. We're not the only person in the world. There's other people. I saw people parking cars yesterday. I don't think they know that there are other people. Just, just an FYI, they're out there. 
It makes me go, oh, am I that way? Do I need to do better? Just saying. Stay humble. Humility is one of Jesus' great characteristics. The creator of the universe took off his outer robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed the disciples' feet. That's humility. We talked about staying hungry, didn't we? Yeah, we did. What are we hungry for? Are we hungry for stuff of the world, or are we hungry for stuff of God? What's going to stand the test of time? I know that donut ain't going to last very long if it's in front of me. But God is forever. And so this week, we pick it up, and we find Jesus emulating the stay positive idea. I did a lot of research this week. I started my research, and what I was hoping to find, <laughs> what I was hoping to find was what, is, what can negativity do to harm us? So I searched the power of negativity, thinking to myself that I would find all these horrible aspects of being a negative person. That is not exactly what came up first. I actually found a list of eight books right at the top of my search. All of them were talking about how the power of negativity is helpful. No lie. The greatest one, a book by Bobby Knight. <laughs> that gets everybody to chuckle when I say that. The power of negativity. If you focus in on the negative things, you'll be able to fix them. And I'm sure if you were a player who played for Bobby Knight, you were motivated by negativity every day. I don't ever want to not set that screen again, right? I don't want to ever not pass to my teammate the way he told me to ever again. That's, <laughs> there's some negative, negative connotations there, right? But it changes behavior. Now, what I also did find out was the truth behind that. And the key to negativity is not that we stay in the negative, the power that they were talking about and the things that they were talking about. The good that can come from negativity is recognizing negative things in your life and making the appropriate changes. That was where they were going with that. Negativity in general in us causes long-term harm. Dr. Karen Lawson from the University of Minnesota found in her research that poorly managed negative emotions are not good for your health. Negative attitudes and feelings of helplessness and hopelessness can create chronic stress, which upsets the body's hormone balance and depletes the brain of chemicals required for happiness, and it damages the immune system. Huh. How many of you, at one point during this week, have said, oh, these gas prices are killing me? How many of you have said that out loud more than once? How many of you have posted it to Facebook? And I'm just talking gas prices. And I'm not talking about everything else in the world that you're doing. Right? We are creatures of negativity. And the best way to do that is to avoid the poorly managed part, as she calls it. What poorly managed negativity means is that we get and find ourselves immersed into negativity before we even understand that we are immersed in negativity. It's true. I am a perfect example. I had to drive in Cincinnati yesterday. It does not take long before you can see the effects of driving in that kind of traffic on me before it compounds, it compounds, it compounds, it compounds, and it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. It's very simple, very easy. Boom, 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 boom. And it's, an, it's just an ex escalation of this. And it's not a logical thought process. It's not a, oh, you really need to be upset with all these people that don't know how to drive. It's, it's one thing, and then, ugh, and then it's another, and then it's, ugh, 
and then it's another, 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 and then it's, uh, and it compounds. Negativity breeds negativity. You've probably seen it with people in your life. They don't often have a very positive thing to say or anything good to say. Their chances of them saying something positive are not going to be good. And it grows and it grows and it grows. And so we as human beings, we have an opportunity to manage the thoughts that we are thinking. We have an opportunity to change what it is that we want to think about so that our brain will not dwell on the negative and then and, and end up shutting off our ability to even think positive. Greatest example, I had a, a, a thought that came through my head this morning as I was driving to Maplewood. Adam and Eve in the garden. Come on. It was perfect. Nobody died. Nobody got sick. They were hanging out with lions like they were cats. You know, house cats. Nobody was dying. Everybody was in love. This was good. They had all they needed to eat. There was no hunger. There was no pain. None of that existed. God gave them this perfect place to live. One rule. See that tree over there? Don't eat from it. Now, I wish... I wish that it was, it was better described to them. Because I, I don't think that they would do it. But then again, we'll see how this goes. I wish that God would have said, listen, every, you have everything you possibly need. All of the goodness in the world is here. You don't have any negativity. You don't have death, dying, mourning, pain, cancer. You don't have any of that. Every day you just get to love life. There's not even a thunderstorm. None of that. It's just good all the time. That tree is going to change that if you eat from it. Because you're going to know what's good and you're going to know what's bad. And then because I told you not to eat from it, there's consequences to that. And it's just going to go downhill from there. So just don't. But also then, talking about that in Maplewood, made me think of the, of the movie The Matrix. Have you ever watched The Matrix? Bas basically, it's uh, machines take over, human beings are batteries. So they take human beings and they plug them into the simulation and they just lay in this thing and they use the energy of humans to do all the machine stuff that they want. Really sci-fi cool stuff. They tried over and over and over again to create the perfect simulation in people's heads. And what happened was they started with the perfect life and the batteries didn't last very long. Because they just had no trauma, they had no turmoil, they had nothing to live for, and so they just died quicker. But when people were faced with trauma, when they were faced with, faced with problems, when things were bad, it increased their longevity. It was more realistic. Hmm. Realistic is that we have problems every day. And we know this. We know that from the beginning of the fall of mankind that we are not perfect. We are going to have to toil over the earth, that death is here. We are faced with the fact that everything around us it was not intended to last forever. None of it. And yet, what is the first thing that we worry about? Stuff that we aren't going to take with us for eternity. It's true. In today's text, we find a group of disciples who are under heavy stress. World, I wouldn't say world class, seasoned fishermen. They've been doing this a while. This is their job, was to go out and fish. I'm sure that they've been in a boat in rough, in rough seas. They've been in rough waters before. They've seen this. What was it about this storm that made it so bad? So much so that this stress overwhelmed them and the negativity was at an all-time high. So much so that they were overwhelmed by it. They had literally just been with Jesus for days. He has been speaking parable after parable and teaching and healing. And Jesus finally says, man, I need a break. Let's get in the boat and we'll cross the Sea of Galilee. 
And so they're like, okay. Jesus knew that he needed a rest. And so they get in the boat. Jesus is taking a nap, right? And the storm comes. They know who Jesus is. They've been with him. They've lived with him. They know who he is and what he's capable of. They even believe that he's the Messiah. Why would they be scared? That's what we say thousands of years later without being in the boat. Come on. Come on, he's Jesus. How many of us react the same way to things in our life, even though we know Jesus is in our boat? Today's text is a metaphor of our life. It really is. We want Jesus in the boat with us, but we always seem to forget that he's there. We always seem to forget what he can do, and we always forget how the story ends. So they took Jesus in the boat, started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. And soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. How many of us believe that, man, we've done this? I've got this relationship with Jesus. I said that sinner's prayer. I've come to this place. I've taken communion. I've been baptized. I mean, whatever it is that that you equate to salvation or Christ, why do I still have bad things happen to me? It's supposed to be perfect. No, it's not. It's not supposed to be perfect. We're not there yet. We're not too perfect yet. This world has fallen and it's broken. And what happens is we constantly are going to have our boat filled with water. We are constantly going to have the storms of life raging and back and forth. Excuse me. (coughs) Back and forth. It's not going to be perfect. It's never going to be. Not since Adam and Eve ruined that for us. But rejoice, church. There is a place that Jesus is trying to get even those disciples to understand. It's not about the storm that you can see. It's about an eternity that you can't. Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. I can only imagine the God, the creator of the universe... Violent storm, enough to to shake the the nerves of seasoned fishermen. And he's just... uh, I I will say this. Once you've been preaching for for so long, and like he had been for days, man, you're going to have a nap nap. It's going to take a nap nap to get you back to right. How many of us have faced this, though? How many of us have said, what are you doing? Why are you sleeping? Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown, they said. We've been there. We've had turmoil in our life. We've had chaos. We've had sickness. We've had disease. We've had death. And in the midst of it, we cry out to God and we lift our hands up and we're like, why, God, don't you love me? What have I done? Can I do anything? Why are you not with me? We've been there. And what we really need is to understand that Jesus is still in the boat. He woke up. He rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. I can't imagine what they felt in that moment, but when he asked them, he said, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? These men have been with Jesus. They've been with him for for a long time at this stage. They've watched him give sight back to the blind. They've watched lame people walk, the paralyzed stand upright. They've watched him change life after life after life to the point where they've actually even uttered the words, yes, Jesus, you are the Messiah. So why are they afraid? Is it because they have no faith? See, when you feel comfortable in this relationship with Christ, the world is going to remind you that it's still the world. It is going to push you into a corner, and it's going to see what you believe. And the disciples then are no different than we are now. 
the world is, const, is a constant proving ground of whether or not we believe in this eternity that we say we believe in when we talk about Jesus. Depending upon what you're watching, depending upon what you're viewing, depending upon what you're putting into your mind over and over again, it can literally take only a few seconds to wake up in the morning and immediately be in a bad mood. Who can say yeah? It might be the circumstances that our life is currently in. It might be the news, which for your information, the news is designed to be negative because that draws you to come back. It's actually more powerful to the brain and the brain chemistry than positive, which is why they keep doing it. And we keep falling for it over and over and over again. It could be that you have some so-called friends who posted something on Facebook that you didn't agree with. It could even just be the weather. One of the things that we have is the ability of knowing who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and where our eternity lies because of him. Sometimes it takes that simple of a thought process. We are worried about a lot of things, are we not? Worried about our house, car, job, kids, family, friends. How many, how many of us have argued, complained about the price of gas this week? It, it adds up over time. And I'm not here to tell you to leave your job and, and go stand on a street corner and talk about eternity. What I'm here to tell you is it's not worth your worry. It's really not. I was on my way from Maplewood to here, and um, Phil Wickham's song, Always Been You, came on. And I, I hear this song, and I'm thinking about how many times in my life when I was at my lowest or when I was at my worst, or so I thought at the time, how much God has been with me every one of those moments. And as that song goes, it's always been you. It's always been you. And every time that I feel like maybe I could give myself a pat on the back because I overcame something, mm -mm. <laughs> if I had it my way, I wouldn't be here right now. Trust me. I've been fighting, I've fought that demon for a long time. If I had it my way, the, the, the one of many car accidents would have taken my life. If I had it my way, the depression from failing would have overcome me many, many times. And every time that I look back at my life, I look back at my life and go, God was there. He was there. He was protecting me in those moments. He was lifting me up when I didn't think I could. He was there giving me hope when there wasn't really any around me. He was there providing for me a way to keep going. He was with me as the storm was raging around my boat, and he's taking a nap back there, and he's saying, why are you so afraid? I got something so big for you. It's called eternity. And I'm super excited about it. I don't want you to worry about the storm. The part of today's text that got me the most was what happens afterwards. See these seasoned fishermen. This storm was so bad that they were terrified for their life. They were afraid. They were scared. After Jesus spoke and the storm stopped, they were more terrified of Jesus than they were that storm. Why have we missed this? How can I understand who this is? That he could calm the wind and the waves. And yet here I am worried about a boat. I'm worried about my life. He's bringing me to a place where there's more than this. 
Jesus promises a new heaven and a new earth. In Revelation 21, 4, he describes what the new heaven and new earth will look like. And he says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the older, the old order of things has passed away. None of the things that you understand as pain and hurt and negativity are going to be there on that other side. So why should we allow that to affect us now? While we are going to have troubles here, promised troubles, they are not going to last forever. How can our positivity in the face of our trials lead others to see this incredible and amazing Jesus that we claim to follow? Amen. Join me as we pray over our offering this morning. Father in heaven, we are grateful that you have provided for us. When we are born and take our first breath, we're, we're guaranteed that we're going to take a last one. When we do so and understand this, we understand that everything in between is a gift. You created us for a purpose. You've been providing us gifts and talents to live on, to provide our daily bread. And God, today we want to acknowledge you and we want to respond. Our offering is a response to you. It's not a get out of jail free card. It's not a salvation card at all. It's simply an offering back to you because we know who you are and we know where our future lies. And we want other people to join us. So if we give back to you what you've already given to us, people will see you. They'll know you love them, and they'll come along with us on this journey. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, who's wanting to calm our storms. With the strength and hope and guidance of your Holy Spirit that is here with us now. Amen. This uh, song came up earlier, and I know I've said it before, but in case you haven't remembered Horatio Spafford is the one who wrote the song, and Horatio lost his family. Over a course of time, he lost several people within his family uh, to the point where uh, he only had a wife and I think two or three daughters left, and he had sent them on a boat uh, to England, and then he was going to join them later. And as their boat was crossing the Atlantic, um, it, it suffered an incident and sank. His wife was the only one to survive. He got a message from his wife that she was safe, but the children were gone. He had already planned to join them, so he was crossing the Atlantic Ocean and virtually, I'm assuming, near the same spot of where he lost his daughters is where Horatio Spafford penned this song. So if you would stand and join me in singing it as well with my soul, with the thought process in mind, this is where he was at in that moment.
So from John Hopkins Medical Online, people with a family history of heart disease who also had a positive outlook were one-third less likely to have a heart attack or other cardiovascular event within 5 to 25 years of those that had a more negative outlook. That's the finding from John Hopkins expert Lisa R. Yannick and her colleagues. The finding held that even people with family history who had the most risk factors of coronary artery disease and positive people from the general population, they were 13% less likely than their negative counterparts to have a heart attack or other coronary event simply because they were not overwhelmed by the flooding boat. Jesus is with you. Rest assured, this trouble is temporary. Be positive. Amen. Have a great week.